Good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. Good afternoon also to some people. Uh, my name is Evelyn Goh and I'm the Shedden Professor of Strategic Policy Studies at the Australian National University from where I'm convening this webinar. Um, I would like to begin with an important convention we observe in Australia by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose lands we meet. The ANU is located in the Australian Capital Territory and the traditional custodians of our land are the Ngunnawal people. We pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Welcome to this third event in our Women in Asia Pacific Security Research Seminar Series. Uh, to our live audience, it's really lovely to see you here with us today. Thank you all for making time to join us. And to those of you who will be tuning in a little bit later to view our recording, greetings, and we hope we'll be able to engage with you live in one of our later seminars in the series when the time zones line up. Our aim in this series is to showcase the cutting edge academic research of women in the fields of Asia Pacific security, broadly defined. Um, and this series is targeted at international scholarly communities working on this important region today. Um, this series comprises interactive um, roundtables as well as virtual research seminars like today as well as events that discuss recently published books. Um, if you look in the chat function for the live audience, you'll see that we've put up two links. Uh, the first link is will take you to the 2021 schedule for this seminar series, which also contains the links to the recordings of our two 2020 events. The second link will take you to today's seminar page uh, which also includes a short reading list of other women scholars working in the topic that we're going to address today, um, publications from other women scholars. So um, right now, it's my very great pleasure to introduce uh, briefly our speaker for today, uh, Dr. Krista Wiegand, who has very kindly agreed uh, to deliver this research seminar. Krista is Director of the Global Security Program and Faculty Fellow at the Baker Center for Public Policy and Associate Professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, where she's now joining us from. Um, Dr. Vigand received her PhD in Political Science from Duke University and she is an international relations scholar specializing in international conflict management and political violence. Um, she is the author of multiple books um, and has co-edited a book as well on these subjects. I'll leave you to look in more detail at her CV for follow up on these publications. Um, Krista is also the co-editor in chief of the journal International, Secured, uh, International Studies Quarterly, which is the flagship journal of the International Studies Association. She's going to speak to us today about a draft paper entitled Power Projection uh, and Deterrence, South China Sea Disputes as Pawns, sorry, South China Sea Disputants as Pawns in the US-China Rivalry. Um, we're going to do this session the following way with Krista's agreement. She's going to speak for about 40 to 45 minutes uh, to set out her analysis and argument in, in what is a very detailed paper. And then we'll spend the rest of the time that we've got in a discussion and Q&A session. Um, and for the Q&A, I invite all participants to try and pose questions using the chat function. And what I'll do is to use mixed methods to ensure that we can address as many discussion points as possible once Krista's finished her presentation. So now um, to assist with the stability of the internet connection, could I ask members of the audience kindly to perhaps turn off your videos as I hand over to Krista for her presentation and then we'll turn them back on again for the discussion segment. Um, Krista, um, if you're ready, very happy to hand over to you at this point. Thank you. <laughs> 
Well, thank you so much, Evelyn, for the invitation. And thank you all uh, this evening or this afternoon or tomorrow in the morning, wherever you are in the world, uh, for attending the talk. So thank you uh, again. Uh, let me just uh, share my screen with you. OK, hopefully everybody can see my screen now. So uh, just to give you a little background, uh, as Evelyn mentioned, uh, my area of specialty is international conflict and security, specifically territorial and maritime disputes. So this is the area in which I'm approaching this paper is not as a China specialist or not necessarily uh, as, a, as a typical power politics person, but looking at this from the context of territorial and maritime disputes. So my previous research, my first book and or second book, and uh, uh, several of my journal articles that I've worked on all frame territorial and maritime disputes in the context of the use, or even I would some, in some cases say manipulation by governments and how these governments use these disputes for bargaining leverage or for strategic reasons. And in some cases, even for nationalist, domestic nationalist purposes to, to mobilize uh, populations. Now, all, not all territorial and maritime disputes are pursued for those reasons, but there are a good number of cases in the world where we see patterns of governments using disputes and kind of taking advantage of them, or in some cases, even starting them or provoking them uh, for the purposes for their own strategic purposes. So that's the context of uh, of this paper, with a slightly different twist, of course. Okay, so the research questions. Most studies that look at the South China Sea, and there are many, many, many studies. There are many books. There are many articles, which is great. It's a very hot topic for for policy reasons, for academic uh, reasons, and so forth. Uh, and um, most of those studies look at specific aspects of the dispute, the legal international law aspect. They look at it uh, from, uh, from a, a naval perspective in terms of freedom of navigation and, uh, and, and naval capabilities uh, and air capabilities. They look at it from a sovereignty, international law, territorial sovereignty and, and maritime rights uh, perspective. So regarding UNCLOS and all the, the maritime entitlements that the features of the rocks, reefs, shoals, and, and banks and islands provide, uh, as well as, of course, all the provocations uh, and uh, low-level tactics, these gray zone tactics that China has pursued over the last decade or so. So there's been a lot of research about, about the South China Sea. So I am building on some of this, but I wanted to kind of step back and, and ask a more broader question, and that is, you know, a lot of people talk about the South China Sea as a flashpoint or a, a cause of maybe it will provoke war between the U.S. and China in particular, the U.S. and allies, I should say, and China. And I'm thinking, I actually wonder if it's the reverse, that this dispute is actually being used primarily by China uh, as a, a means as, or as is part of a greater strategic rivalry with the U.S. And so therefore, it's not necessarily a uh, a cause, but actually a consequence. Um, I'm also wondering, of course, what are China's ultimate goals here? I mean, there are, again, lots of explanations, lots of theories about what China's doing. Uh, lots of China specialists have made excellent arguments, Chinese scholars themselves, uh, and, and so forth, China watchers. Uh, so why is China pursuing these low-level provocations? Why did they, in the past few years, since, uh, you know, 2012, 2013, why did they start seizing features, maritime features, and, and militarizing them and building them up? And of course, they're continuing to harass uh, disputants in the South China Sea. So those are the main questions that I'm asking here. My theory is, as I mentioned at the beginning, more broadly, that China is using these territorial and maritime claims as part of its greater strategic rivalry with uh, the U.S. And what I propose here is a theory, again, it's just, it's just a, new, a, a new term uh, called projected to deterrence. So it's a combination of pro power projection and deterrence. Uh, and so it combines compellence, it combines deterrence, traditional compellence, traditional deterrence, and power, uh, power projection. So that's the causal story that I'll be talking about. And what I'm arguing is that the end goals for China are to increase costs for the US uh, for deterrence purposes so that they don't 
there's no threat to the China, to the Chinese mainland by by establishing a security barrier in the South China Sea, and uh, and also simultaneously expanding Chinese power projection further into the Pacific. So that's essentially a, uh, establishing strategic depth. So China is essentially using this dispute, these claims, to build up their military capabilities with strategic depths and more effectively deter the U.S. Now, this is just one of the strategies it's using and one of the regions, it's areas it's using. We could talk much more about all the other regions of the world where China is reaching out uh, with the Belt Road Initiative and all these other investments in Africa and so forth. So this is just one piece of that uh, broader, uh, broader uh, strategy. So this dispute, I would argue, can be understood in the context of power politics rather than just a traditional territorial maritime dispute. So the theory that I'll talk about has essentially three stages. Uh, direct deterrence, so we're talking about a, a, a typical uh, state, in this case a rising power, China, trying to deter an attack on it's on that state from uh, a potential attacker. So for the, from the, this is all from the perspective of China, I should say. The US probably has the same, I know that the US has the same uh, perspective that it's trying to deter China. Uh, but in this case, China is deterring the US. So the US here is considered the potential attacker. The second part here is the idea that China is compelling or using coercion. And this is the harassment, this is the seizing of, of maritime features and so forth against the disputants in the South China Sea, primarily Vietnam and the Philippines, a little bit Malaysia, but those are the two main uh, target states. And these are states that essentially control what I would call offshore territories. And these territories are not actually territories as we know, they're maritime features that have become uh, artificial islands, but nevertheless, they are uh, important to China's strategy. And then the third stage is a subsequent stage that is only possible through a combination of direct deterrence and compellence of these disputants. And that is this idea of projected deterrence uh, by, by China as the rising power of the status quo state simultaneously projecting its power. Now I'll talk a little later about whether this is uh, a balance of power concept or power transition concept. I actually think it's a little bit of both and a little bit of neither. So that's, a, I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, a little later. Okay, so I'll start off with direct deterrence. You're all familiar, I'm sure, with the concept of deterrence. Uh, you know, in this case, direct deterrence uh, refers specifically to the state that is uh, trying to avoid being attacked. So we're not talking about uh, extended deterrence, like with an ally. Uh, so in the case, you know, extended deterrence would be the U.S. Uh, deterring China from attacking Taiwan, for example, or the U.S. deterring uh, North Korea from attacking South Korea. So that's that's extended deterrence. This is just very simply direct deterrence. Will the U.S. attack China? And if so, if there's any chance, China needs to actively deter the U.S. directly. And the way they do that, the way that a defender state, the state that could be attacked, uh, would, would deter is through increasing costs. And uh, that way, by increasing costs, uh, the defender state is less, I'm sorry, the potential attacker is less likely to, it becomes too costly to, or, or high, the costs are so high, the potential attacker reconsiders the attack and does not pursue the attack. So we know that uh, China has had ex exponential growth uh, of their military spending in the past two decades. There is so much evidence of this. Uh, China watchers, military watchers are uh, very aware of this. Um, according to a, a, a 2020 Department of Defense, U.S. Department of Defense report to Congress over the past two decades, uh, China strengthened and modernized its um, uh, army and navy in nearly every aspect. Um, it's built, a, built the largest navy in the world, and, and there are recent reports lately of uh, up to 2040, 2035, 2040, uh, where at some point in the, in the time period between now and then, China's Navy capabilities will in fact uh, tilt the balance uh, against the US and they will have stronger uh, naval capabilities. So that is a concern um, and, and clearly evidence that there is, uh, China is creating, building this huge Navy for, to, det to deter somebody and we, we assume it's the US and uh, US allies and then the US led uh, system. So such military growth is substantial. Uh, it's a subs I'm sorry, substantive, and it's very challenging to the U.S. 
and it is uh, clearly, in my view, a form of uh, direct deterrence. But uh, deterrence from the mainland is less effective than if it's coupled with what we would call offshore deterrence capability. So in the, the case of the US, uh, the US has bases all over the world. We have, uh, there is, there is uh, um, the, the ability to, to, to increase costs and deter uh, is, is spread broadly across the world. And in, from a naval uh, perspective, uh, we have uh, many bases, of course, in, uh, in Asia itself, and of course in Guam and Hawaii. Uh, and in the in the Middle Pacific, so the U.S. is very capable of uh, of of having these offshore capabilities. China, on the other hand, um, is new to this game, and I'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. So, compellence again. This is you know a simple, a traditional security concept uh, about uh, how one state tries to force or coerce another state, usually a weaker state, uh, to change a policy or stop doing something. In this case, I'm talking about the disputants in the, in the South China Sea. So these are states that maintain, have maintained control uh, of, of certain maritime features, and uh, China has essentially seized these, uh, these maritime features. Or uh, it also can involve uh, the, the harassment that, we, that we've seen, uh, not just against the US, but also directly against uh, the disputant states themselves. So we know, that, you know Vietnam, Malaysia, last year, there were some quite a few harassment, uh, well, there are always lots of harassment tactics, but some of the bigger ones uh, more recently were, were um, against uh, Vietnam and Malaysia last year. So uh, what compellence does is it signals resolve to those states, of course, uh, and it compels the defender states, the disputants in this case, to uh, consider their demands. They don't have a choice. They're weaker states. These are states that do not have cap military capabilities to stand up to China. China knows this. China takes advantage of them. Done. So Mr. Reef was taken in 1995. Other reefs, other uh, maritime features were taken from Vietnam. Uh, most recently in 2012, Scarborough Shoal was taken from the Philippines directly in the uh, Philippine exclusive economic zone uh, right off the coast of the Philippines. So that is pretty bold uh, uh, example. Those are, that's a pretty bold example of, of compellence. So the, this, is the, uh, this is the part where China is then is, is using, they're deterring the US and directly, but there's also this strategy of, of compelling these other states to change their strategy, change their policy and essentially turn over uh, these uh, maritime features without choice essentially. So the next part is uh, this theory of uh, the revised theory of uh, the new theory of, of projected deterrence is combination. So after decades of focusing on the continent, primarily at deterring the Soviet Union, and then of course on the coast, uh, focusing very narrowly on Taiwan, and for good reason, of course. Um, you know, over the last couple decades, there's been a broader shift to the broader, the wider Pacific. So China has, uh, we all know, has has been shifting its focus much more beyond uh, uh, trying to uh, reacquire Taiwan, uh, Taiwan from a sovereignty perspective. So, um, where is this coming from? Well, uh, China is clearly challenging uh, U.S. military dominance in the Indo-Pacific region, mainly in Southeast Asia. Uh, specifically in the South China Sea. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, unlike the US, uh, China does not have foreign bases. They are starting to now. They're build, trying to build one in, in, in Cambodia. They're trying to, they're building Navy bases in, uh, in Africa, on, on the African coast, and in other parts of the, uh, the world, uh, but very different than the US. So China is, is starting at a much uh, reduced capacity uh, in terms of offshore basing. Uh, for projection and deterrence reasons. Uh, they also don't have allies where they can put bases uh, the way that the US does. Um, so China is, is starting in this position and it really needs to catch up quickly. So the, the South China Sea is a great kind of starting point to dive into like literally uh, in a really strong way just to, um, just to go full force ahead and uh, with both power projection and deterrence. So how, uh, where does this, where does the South China Sea fit? Well, militarization of the of these uh, maritime features that were seized, as well as increased 
uh, control of the water. So China um, policing and, uh, and, and spending a lot having ships in the region in the sea trying to harass uh, others that are and trying to stop freedom of navigation and, and harassing both US and allied vessels as well as the disputant vessels directly um, has allowed China to do two things. It's allowed, uh, it's allowed its, uh, an extension of its military capabilities for power projection reasons. And then it is allowing a deterrence, further deterrence from away from the mainland and to deny uh, not just a, not just to, 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 to deter a potential attack on, on China, but more broadly to deny U.S. military actions in the region more broadly. So this is essentially a, de some people call it deterrence by denial uh, effort to deny the U.S. the ability to maintain its status as the dominant military uh, power in the region, in the Indo-Pacific. So these Chinese land grabs then, and all these maritime clashes in the South China Sea have allowed China to create these offshore bases, which provide, as I mentioned earlier, strategic depth to expand into the Pacific and challenge US dominance in the region, and then also create this security barrier, which raises the costs of any potential US attack on the Chinese mainland, mainland as well as denying access uh, to parts of the region uh, for, for the U.S. as well as its allies, but the, the focus, of course, is on the U.S. Now, I should mention that uh, this is not unique to the South China Sea. Uh, the East China Sea is also a potential access point uh, to uh, the broader Pacific for China. And China also, as, as uh, you may know, has a claim, a territorial maritime claim on uh, the Senkaku slash Dayu Islands, depending on if you're Japanese or Chinese. Uh, Ch Japan maintains uh, control of, of those islands. It's not, they're not, again, not even really islands. Uh, some of them are, but they're not, they're not all islands. Uh, China also has very similar claims. Uh, the, the, the claims are not quite as extensive as, in terms of like the nine dash line that China has in the South China Sea. The difference in my perspective between the East China Sea and the South China Sea is that the disputant is Japan. And Japan is not the Philippines. <laughs> Japan is not Malaysia or Vietnam. Those states are much weaker. Uh, the US, even though it's allied with the Philippines, that alliance, is, as you may know, is, is much weaker. There are no bases since the early 19, 1990s in the Philippines. So the, the, the US alliance system in the, in the so southern parts, in Southeast Asia, is much weaker. Uh, than in Northeast Asia. So we have Korea, we have Japan, we have tens of thousands of American troops uh, and airmen and naval vessels and Navy uh, stationed in, uh, in, right in Eastern uh, Northeast Asia, including the Ryoko Island chain, not very far from um, these disputed waters in the East China Sea. So that is a little more difficult for China to confront in terms of uh, power projection and deterrence uh, to use that dispute for the same strategic purposes. I think it is still very strategic why they're claiming the East China Sea. To, for, it is for, this, for similar reasons, but it is, much, it is a much more difficult uh, pursuit than it would be, than it, uh, than it has been, I should say, for in, in the South China Sea. So I want to talk now about some competing explanations. And I don't think that these are, I should, maybe I shouldn't use the term competing because I don't think these are necessarily competing, but I think that they are alternative explanations that we could consider as China's primary goals for uh, its South China Sea claims and actions. The first one is that China just truly believes that these are legal, they have legal rights and legal sovereignty claims to the islands and maritime features and waters in the, in the South China Sea. So this is the nine dash line claim based on uh, uh, 1947 uh, uh, claim that Taiwan made uh, and based on a historic map and uh, that was, was reinstated in 2009 by the Chinese um, in a note verbal to the United Nations. So this is a, a fairly vague uh, sovereignty claim. Uh, China essentially claims the, the South China Sea as internal waters. So nothing that actually, that concept does not exist in the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea. Uh, 
uh, so for the Love Sea. It's not a, there's no such thing except in a bay. Uh, obviously the South China Sea is not a bay. Uh, so China has essentially made up its own uh, legal definition of internal waters. Uh, and, and there's no question, I think, that you know, from a legal perspective, China is pushing uh, this claim from a legal perspective, um, but uh, there's some questions about whether this is, is really the main goal, and I'll talk about that in a minute. The other alternative explanation is the economic benefits. There's lots of evidence of oil and natural gas, well, I should say there, there's, it is expected to be, <laughs> there's evidence of, of uh, exploration uh, of an assumption of oil, natural gas, seabed, particularly seabed minerals. The seabed uh, in the continental shelf, uh, those are where things are happening right now uh, in terms of maritime exploration, resource uh, exploitation. So there is a potential that China is pursuing this, uh, these claims and actions for, uh, for those reasons. So from, from the perspective of the legal sovereignty claims, as I mentioned, these are fairly vague claims. Uh, and, and if you look at the legal claims that China has made over the last 11 or 12 years, um, they've been fairly inconsistent, uh, not only from an international perspective, but actually domestically as well. So people who do research within China or have interviewed people off the record in the government and the military and so forth have heard conflicting statements, conflicting claims. There are conflicting reasons given why China is doing what it's doing in the South China Sea. So there's a little bit of ambivalence, or a lot, I should say a lot, it's, and it is, uh, many people say it's, and I, I believe this, that it's actually very deliberate to have an ambiguous claim so that China doesn't get backed into a corner le from a legal perspective. But that also tells me that, that suggests that China doesn't really want to resolve this dispute. And the reason I say that is there are two reasons. The first uh, is China does have a history of resolving its disputes peacefully, bilaterally in most cases, um, yeah, but there's no way China's going to resolve this dispute. There is no indication whatsoever. Uh, and by far the, cl the clearest uh, s signal of that is the 2013 to 2016 arbitration case that, that the Philippines brought uh, through an Annex uh, 7 tribunal against China in which China refused to participate, refused to acknowledge uh, the, uh, the, the tribunal uh, was even going on and then of course refused to has refused to comply with the rulings which 90 percent of which ruled against china there are there actually is evidence that if china were to seek legal uh dispute resolution china would actually have a case for some of the maritime features for some of the waters based on historic precedent historic treaties and historic maps and so forth so if china really wanted this for legal sovereign reasons they could actually pursue, they could go to the International Court of Justice uh, in particular, or to the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea, or even an Annex 7 uh, arbitration tribunal, and they could say, look, we have proof now. But that's not really what's happening. Um, part of that is because China does not want to participate in those multilateral dispute resolution mechanisms and doesn't really respect that uh, Western, if you will, uh, form of, of dispute me mechanisms. China, however, is a signatory, a signatory and uh, ratified uh, UNCLOS. Uh, so it is not, it is supposed to be following UNCLOS, uh, but it is not. I should mention also, uh, just for the record, the United States is not a member of UNCLOS either, even though uh, the lawyers who created UNCLOS were uh, primarily American. So you may know that uh, co the US Congress is, uh, has never been willing to ratify for a variety of reasons that we don't have time to get into. Uh, but, but nevertheless, the U.S., even though the U.S. has not ratified UNCLOS, the uh, U.S. government's position is that it pursues and follows and complies with UNCLOS rules and the articles in UNCLOS, so uh, it still is uh, complying with UNCLOS. So that's the, that's the argument there. Uh, so there seem to be several indicators here that China's end goal is not to just acquire these for sovereignty reasons, to say these are Chinese. Seems like there's something more strategic going on. Now, from an economic perspective, uh, there are lots of potential uh, significant resources, as I mentioned, up to 11 billion barrels of oil, 190 tons of cubic feet of uh, natural gas. We have 12% of the international fish catch, which is huge. In fact, fishing may, 
be considered more important than oil and natural gas, especially in the next few decades, if energy is shifting to more natural resources or, or uh, non-gas uh, uh, and oil resources. Uh, so fish, fishing is, is very important, and that's where a lot of these clashes have occurred between China and Vietnam, Malaysia, Philippines primarily, uh, is over fishing access. Um, however, um, China has not really sought out these resources either. So there has been, there have been a few cases where China has sent exploration vessels uh, to uh, seek or to explore for resources, but they're not really, uh, they don't seem very uh, uh, valid, like they don't seem to be very valid, uh, re, uh, that's not their valid purpose. And in, in many cases, it seems like it's really just harassment more than anything. So there really has been um, very limited exploration and attempts at a, a full acquisition. And, and more importantly, there is not, as I just said, there has been no attempt to resolve the dispute to achieve secure access to these resources. And the reason that's important is that even though China has its own oil companies uh, to do the exploration, uh, it is very difficult, especially for other oil companies, they are very unwilling or they are willing to buy oil from a disputed territory or gas. So there, the East China Sea, for example, there has been, it's been very difficult or off the, you may have heard of the case, uh, a dispute between uh, Turkey and Greece in the Aegean Sea over oil and natural gas resources. So there's, oil companies are very hesitant to get involved in any dispute unless it's resolved in any waters, I should say, until they're resolved, the mar maritime boundaries are resolved. And that is not going to happen in, in this case. Um, and, and more mo finally, there's been no attempt at joint development. Unlike the East China Sea, where Japan and China actually do have an agreement beyond the areas where the dispute actually, the overlap per occurs, on the outer bands of that overlap, there has been uh, some agreement for joint development of resources in, in, that, uh, in the East China Sea. That has not been the case at all. Uh, there have been talk there's been some talk of joint development. Uh, some states are balking at uh, joint development with, with China, but China has not pushed it, uh, that agenda very much. So to me, that signals this is not really the, per the main purpose for uh, China's activities in the South China Sea. So I'm gonna turn now to what I would call, what I, what I think is, is um, a good amount of evidence that's, that suggests uh, that China does in fact need or has a justification for deterring the U.S. and then also power projection uh, as well. So to start off with, um, the Chinese defense position statements talk about the South China Sea in the context of a U.S.-China rivalry. So to me, that's a clear, I mean, that's as direct as you can get um, in terms of the, the role of the South China Sea in that context. So that's from the Chinese perspective. Um, if we go back to the 2011 Asia pivot of the Obama administration in the U.S., uh, this is when we really see uh, the strategic rivalry that we see now taking off, even though the Obama administration was not as hostile as the Trump administration against China. Uh, the pivot was interpreted by China. They were a little surprised or even in some cases people say they were shocked by the pivot and the, and the, and the focus, and it was believed that uh, that it was in fact pursued, the, the pivot was pursued as a direct challenge to China's growing role in the region. Uh, and so we've seen an expansion of Chinese military capabilities since then, of course. Uh, from a military perspective, the 2010 US, uh, US Air Sea Battle military strategy has a, a new name since 2015, it's a longer name. Um, this is a Pentagon uh, offensive plans to take out Chinese missile sites, infrastructure, communications, all sorts of things in mainland China. So this exists. This is a, you know, this is a document. This is a plan. Uh, it's probably not, it wouldn't, it hasn't been pursued, obviously, and it probably won't be. Uh, some, many military analysts in the USA, it's not necessary, but the plan exists. And the fact that it exists and that there is a offensive plan to take out, of course, they would call it deterrence, you know, defensive. Uh, but it essentially it is offensive to take out um, or attack the mainland of China. This is uh, this would be I think this is would be alarming to China and justify uh, increased military capabilities uh, to deter the U.S. Now, 
since the uh, seizure, the seizures of these maritime features um, were in the earlier 2010s, but since then, um, during the, sta the, the, the stage of, of building up these islands and militarizing them, um, a number of US uh, uh, military strategy came out, the Department of Defense Asia Pacific Maritime Strategy, the US, I'm sorry, the Chinese interpretation of this was uh, that uh, the US was planning, it was essentially containing China uh, as part of the US uh, great power, US China great power competition. Uh, the 2017 National Security Strategy of the Trump administration uh, talked about forward military presence in the Pacific, in South Pacific, uh, Southeast Asian uh, Pacific region uh, to deter and deny uh, and if necessary defeat China. So that's again right there we have Chinese justification for deterrence. Uh, and then uh, most recently uh, a declassified 2018 White House document uh, lists um, maintaining U.S. primacy in the Indo-Pacific and preventing China from establishing what it's referred to as an illiberal sphere of influence as primary strategic goals. So here we have direct evidence of, uh, of a need to deter um, uh, from, uh, for China to deter the U.S. Not just from a direct deterrence perspective, but more broadly, and I'll talk about that now. So why, what does this have to do with the South China Sea? Well, here we have, this is where the South China Sea comes in, in terms of creating a security barrier. And this is done through anti-access area denial. So this kind of deterrence by denial um, strategy of having these capabilities, militarizing these artificial islands, um, providing offshore basing, providing forward deployment. So we have surface to air missiles, we have anti-ship cruise missiles, we have air and maritime defense systems, fighter aircraft that have um, the, uh, that have radar and so forth, and uh, and fighter aircraft and, and long runways. Um, so what does this do? Well, this uh, projects power, which I'll talk about in a minute. But from a deterrence perspective, it pushes out the uh, it, this this uh, these capabilities to deter the U.S. more directly in the region, uh, more closely out in the, in, into the Pacific a little bit. Uh, and so essentially what this is doing is it's impeding freedom of navigation, it's limiting U.S. Uh, air power capabilities in addition to all of the harassment that uh, China is doing to the disputants themselves. So essentially this, this uh, anti-access area denial by China is providing effective deterrence or fairly effective deterrence uh, of U.S. military act activities in the region overall. So it's not just deterring an attack on China, but it is pushing out uh, the, the it's, it's causing problems for uh, the, the, the U.S. goal of maintaining uh, dominance, uh, military dominance in the region in the long term. Now from a power projection standpoint, um, the longtime maritime strategy of China, well, uh, we know that China wants to counter U.S. This U.S. strategic advantage in the region and specifically challenge the U.S.-led rules-based order. And this, of course, includes UNCLOS and uh, freedom of navigation and so forth that I've talked about before. Uh, of course, there's been a significant increase in naval capabilities, and there will be uh, to move to our strong blue water navy. Uh, 2040 is, you know, is this kind of date of when things will really be, you know, this super strong uh, Navy in particular. Um, but from a power projection standpoint, it's not just uh, signaling resolve and showing that uh, China's capable. What it's, in my view, it's very much combined with a deterrent strategy. And this is why it's hard for me to pull these apart. I don't think we can say they're just deterring, they're just projecting power. It really is a combined uh, strategy. So from a, from a projection standpoint uh, and deterrent standpoint, um, China is now able to move beyond this first island chain to the second island chain, providing further access uh, to uh, US naval vessels further out in the Pacific, uh, as well as US bases, airfields, US territory with long range missiles. Um, and this access to the second island chain and, and, and beyond um, has increased China's naval reach, um, and it's really going to tilt the balance of power. And I've seen reports, I mean, there's lots of reports by think tanks in the U.S. and in, in Australia and other China watchers saying, you know, when is this going to happen? It, it is, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. 
And this is, uh, I, some people are more alarmed than others, but there's definitely a, uh, a cautious uh, watching of this happening. So the South China Sea, in my view, provides this expanded maritime domain, sea control, broadened access to the Pacific. Now it's not ideal, it's not the, that they're going really far into the Pacific because the Philippine uh, island chain, the archipelago, still is fairly limiting, uh, but um, overall it does provide a fairly effective means to challenge the U.S. as the dominant actor in the region uh, and the U.S. alliance network in, in the Indo-Pacific overall. So to conclude, um, I looked at, I'm, I questioned the primary objectives of the South China Sea, uh, or of China's actions in the South China Sea, examining three explanation, uh, explanations. And I, I think that the primary purpose is quite strategic uh, to deter US threats to China and also project uh, Chinese power. And as a result, I think this, con you know, when we're talking about this conflict and this dispute, Unfortunately, the disputants themselves are kind of uh, really pawns in this game uh, of great power politics. And this is not really about the Philippines. Um, I actually did spend, I spent uh, a semester in Manila interviewing military officials and, and uh, government officials and US, US, both US uh, and Philippine officials about this, the South China Sea from the Philippines perspective. And I will never forget a, uh, in a confidential interview with a high-ranking uh, U.S. Embassy staff person, he told me, we are only here because of the geostrategic location of the Philippines. That is why it's important and we need to deter China from that perspective. And it was very blunt, uh, but I think that's, a, that's one of the reasons why the South China Sea is, is, is such a geostrategically important uh, region. Now, in terms of uh, feedback, I look forward to your comments and questions. Uh, but I do want to leave you with a few points where I'm trying to decide if this is something, these are kind of questions that I think would a reviewer say this in a journal review. Uh, being a journal editor, I'm always trying to think about what reviews would, reviewers would say. And I want to ask uh, if anybody has any insight into whether it's necessary to distinguish between deterrence of the U.S. Uh, attacking China, the traditional definition of deterrence, um, versus this broader deterrence of denial of, of U.S. military presence or actions in the broader Indo-Pacific, um, in, of course, in, in this case, in Southeast Asia, but just the presence, the military presence, the military dominance. Um, the second factor, I'm not sure it matters or not, does if it, I'm trying to figure out if it matters that China's a rising power and that the U.S. is a status quo power, is this important? Maybe it's not. Uh, I also wonder, uh, I've had, I had, I gave, presented this paper before about a month ago and somebody said, this is, a, this is a question of balance of power or power transition theory, you know, and, and is, is China trying to transition its, you know, uh, through traditional uh, power transition or is it trying to balance the U.S.? And I'm not really sure. I really would rather stay away from that debate. I think it's a mix of both, uh, but, but I'd like to hear some feedback. And then finally, I, uh, it would be great to, to hear if you have any perspective on whether this theory is applicable to other cases or is this something unique to the South China Sea. With, with the, when, when I did my research on the East China Sea, I was able to find uh, cases all across the, the world of very similar patterns uh, in Guatemala and Belize, Spain and Gibraltar and the UK and Morocco, uh, in the UK and Northern Morocco uh, and China and Russia, the Soviet Union uh, and a number of, of many other cases uh, as well. So uh, that's something I haven't yet uh, research, but I, but I'm, I'm hoping that would be the case. So I'm going to stop there, and I'll stop sharing my screen. So thank you all very much. I look forward to your comments and questions. Thanks very much, Krista. That was, uh, that was great, and thank you so much for um, leaving plenty of time for a great discussion um, in the remaining time that we've got. Um, it's, it's quite, it's always really helpful when we've got a, a such a detailed but efficient. Um, summary of, of what is actually quite a long paper. So th thank you for doing that. I think this places actually everyone in the audience on, on a good footing to be able to engage uh, with the substance of, of what's in, in your paper, regardless of whether they've actually read the paper itself. Um, so thank, thank you for that. Um, I, I'm going to, as, as I explained earlier, um, uh, invite uh, participants to, to 
uh, leave us questions in the chat function if possible. That's just easier for, for me to see than if you do a raise hand function. I'm also at this point going to invite participants, if you like, and you're comfortable with it, to turn your videos back on so we have a bit more of a sense of being in a, a research seminar rather than a sort of, you know, distant activity. Um, and if you like, please, you know, turn on the, the gallery function as well so we can see more of each other. That's up to you. Um, uh, Krista, I, I'm going to, uh, in a way, take the chess pro prerogative to, to insert one uh, response, actually, to, to your final uh, uh, request for feedback there. Um, and it's to suggest that it seems to me that we, when we think about this China case that you've put forward so eloquently, one of the things that obviously needs to be considered from a strategic point of view is the old fashioned geo in geopolitics. You know, um, geography, of course, matters enormously. Um, and what I felt might have benefited from a bit of airing in your paper is the fact that, of course, when we look at the East Asian theatre in which the South China Sea sits, you know, the relative import of that strategic domain for China as opposed to for the United States is completely different. Um, this is, if we put it very bluntly, this is China's backyard. It's China's home ground as well. So we think in terms of analogies, you know, it would be kind of like what, how we would think about the US's power projection in the Caribbean and, you know, the Western Pacific, right? P probably stretching up to Guam. So how would we regard what's happening, you know, uh, US bases and projections in that uh, Western hemisphere? Right, that, that for me would be the parallel for just in geographical terms for what China does or doesn't do in the South China Sea and what it's trying to project in the South China Sea. Now, I think that's a small but quite important shift because I feel that instinctively for many people who discuss this issue about China's projection in the South China Sea, the thing that they're comparing it to is US projection in East Asia, right? Um, and that's just a wrong comparator. If you, if you take into account what I've just said about the relative import of the strategic domains being actually very different, home ground, non-home ground, sphere of influence, if you'd like to use the old uh, phrase, you know, something that is much more than a sphere of influence when it's projected halfway across the world. So I, I don't know exactly what terms you would like to use, but I feel that that geo strategic element would actually explain quite a bit and shift um, the focus quite a lot when we look at what China might conceivably be doing in terms of A to AD in this domain. Yeah, um, but I'll just leave it there with that very brief suggestion. I'd like to, um, you know, to, to kick this off, um, my colleague, Professor Brendan Taylor at uh, the Strategic and Defense Studies Center has very kindly agreed to, to kick us off a bit more um, into this discussion. Brendan's read your paper and, and I believe has, has a few um, critical points to make to, to help us get into this discussion. Brendan, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Evelyn. I'm, I'm not sure how critical they'll, they'll be. I thought it was an excellent uh, paper and I'm conscious that we also have a very distinguished audience. I think a more distinguished audience than, than useful. So I'll try to keep these remarks um, fairly, fairly brief. But one of the things I really, I really liked about Krista's paper is I, I don't think that we spend you know, nearly enough time talking about the strategic end. Um, I think this, this dovetails with the point you just made, Evelyn. I think that you know, some of the defensive motivations that drive Beijing's policies and behaviours towards the South China Sea disputes. And um, you know, I think the, the paper makes a, a very important contribution to that endeavour. I'd like to make um, three observations um, about the paper, um, if I may. And the first of those relates to the paper's focus on China's defensive motivations. And I think that there are several areas where I think some further examples could usefully be added to, to further strengthen the paper's overarching argument. Um, I think some mention, for example, could be made of China's efforts to establish so-called um, bastions for its submarines in, in the South China Sea. So what I'm talking about here, Crystal will be very aware of this already, but for, for others in the audience who may not be in those, those deep, heavily defended waters where, where China can hide its, um, its small and potentially vulnerable SSBN um, force, I think that would be helpful to add something on that in the paper. 
I'd also like to see the paper draw out the South China Sea's strategic importance to Beijing in the context of the increasingly salient Taiwan flashpoint. And I think this could be done potentially from an historical perspective. I think by pointing out that it was through establishing a foothold in the South China Sea uh, that Imperial, Imperial Japan was able to capture portions of, of China as part of its ultimately unsuccessful attempt to become Asia's dominant power during the 1930s and the 1940s. Now, I think defending against a modern day rerun of, of that potentiality, a major power using the South China Sea as a launching pad for operations during a Taiwan contingency, I think that remains an important preoccupation for Beijing. Given that the paper focuses quite heavily on the importance of Beijing's uh, artificial features in the South China Sea, I think it would also benefit from some engagement with the ongoing debate regarding how strategically significant these features really are in practice. Now, some analysts have argued that these features are tremendously important, that they would allow Beijing to control the waters in the airspace of the South China Sea, um, even if this flashpoint were, were to erupt in, into conflict. Um, but there are also many analysts who dispute this claim, and they suggest that these outposts are, are next to impossible to defend, and that they'd be very likely taken out in the early stages of, of any military confronta uh, confrontation. I think it would be good if the, if the paper could, uh, could perhaps acknowledge uh, that debate and, and perhaps possibly even uh, situate itself um, within that debate. The second point I'd, I'd like to make, um, and I think Evelyn, this, this reinforces the, the point that you were making in your opening uh, remarks. Um, I think it relates to Krista's introduction of the, the concept of projected deterrence. Um, I think that this is potentially the most innovative and, and, ex and exciting theoretical contribution of, of the paper. Um, as I was reading the paper, however, I couldn't help but wondering whether something new is, is really happening here or whether what Krista is really talking about is, is the emerging or is the re-emergence of a, of a much older concept, the concept of um, strategic perimeters. A strategic perimeters, um, as defined by our, our late colleague, um, Coral Bell, um, are those geographic zones in which the strategic capabilities of, of other powers are a matter of watchful concern to armed forces and, and their governments. But this was, of course, a concept that enjoyed its, its heyday during the early decades of the Cold War. Um, it was Dean Acheson's failure in 1950 to include Korea inside the publicly declared US strategic perimeter, which was arguably a leading cause of the Korean War. And likewise, it was Moscow's placement of nuclear capable missiles inside the US strategic perimeter that brought the world to the edge of the nuclear abyss during those fateful 13 days of October 1962. But a couple um, of more recent policy documents have led me to wonder whether the, the concept of strategic perimeters might be making a, a comeback. And the first of those was the recently declassified US strategic framework for the Indo-Pacific, which talks about defending the first island chain nations, including Taiwan, and dominating all domains outside the first island chain. Now, does the first island chain today represent uh, Washington's current conception, perhaps, of a, of a US strategic perimeter in Asia? The second policy document was Australia's own 2020 defense strategic update, which focuses our defense planning on Australia's so-called immediate region, defined as the area ranging from the northeast, um, northeastern Indian Ocean through maritime and mainland Southeast Asia to Papua New Guinea and the Southwest Pacific. Now, I wonder, is, is this perhaps Australia's you know, most recent enunciation of its own strategic perimeter, and perhaps. Now, as, as I was reading through Krista's paper, I wondered whether Beijing's behavior in the South China Sea also reflects the PRC establishing its own strategic perimeter, rather than what Krista calls projected deterrence. So at the very least, Krista, I'd be, be really interested in what you see as the relationship um, and the potential points of distinction uh, between the, these two concepts. Finally, I just, I just had a very quick question about the, the timeframe um, of the paper, um, and particularly its focus um, upon Beijing's policies and, and behaviors over the past decade. I think this question was largely inspired by the fact that I was also recently reading another excellent article on the South China Sea um, by my compatriot, Andrew Chubb, in the latest issue of International Security. I'm not sure whether you've had a chance to, to read Andrew's paper as yet, Krista, but for the benefits, once again, of, of others in, in the audience who haven't, Andrew's argument is that Chinese provocations against disputants in the South China Sea represent a, a much longer term project that stretches back at least half a century. 
And he argues that while Beijing's South China Sea assertiveness has been steadily increasing during the period since, there have been, been at least four surges, or what he calls surges in Chinese assertiveness in 1973, in 1987, in 1992, and finally in 2007. And Andrew argues that what we are seeing presently is, is merely a continuation of that last surge, which transpired over a decade ago, rather than something new or, or more recent. Now, to be honest, I'm, I'm still digesting that, and I haven't made up my mind whether Andrew is right or not. He, he could well be wrong, as, as fine a scholar as, as Andrew is. But um, I'd really be interested in, in your thoughts on, um, on, on Andrew's argument, because it's something that I'm, I'm as you can tell, still, still grappling with. Now, Krista, I hope these thoughts on your, your very, very fine paper are at least somewhat helpful. Um, and many thanks again both to, to yourself and to, to Evelyn for the, the opportunity to, to share these thoughts with this um, distinguished audience today. Great, thank Thanks you very so much, Brendan. Krista, would you like to respond quickly to any of Brendan's points? Sure, just very briefly, so we have uh, some time. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Brendan. These are great points, and I think um, it's interesting because uh, you know I struggle with the, the 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 terminology and wondered is this really new? But I I, I do think uh, you know maybe may I like that term you know the the, the concept strategic perimeter, uh, but I I feel like to some degree, I am making that argument, maybe not in the, the strongest sense that it's just because it's like, as Evelyn said earlier, China's backyard. Um, I, you know, I, I, I feel like, uh, yes, absolutely, the geostrategic location and the, that, you know, China's wanting to, I, I have no doubt that China wants a strategic perimeter. But I feel like it's beyond that. I feel I feel like it, you know at least China's long-term goal up to 2040, uh, and it's everything it's doing with its multilateral institutions, its creation of these institutions, its you know investments internationally and so forth, is really challenging the status quo dominance of the U.S. from a from a power transition perspective. So I think it's not it goes beyond uh, just the 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 strategic perimeter in terms of military. Perimeter. And I, I understand the U.S., you know, certainly the Western Hemisphere and so forth. The difference in my perspective is the U.S. has bases literally all over the world. There really is no strategic perimeter anymore for the U.S. It is the world, in my view. You know, so I think what's, I don't think China is going to get to that point in our lifetimes, but I feel like that is the long-term goal. And I, you know, in terms of a power transition. So I agree that I, you know, I love that term strategic perimeter. I think that I absolutely agree um, that this is, when I use the term strategic depth and security barrier, that's essentially what I'm talking about. So it, it, it's just a different terminology, but yes, I, I agree. I think it's just a little bit beyond that. Um, I did read Andrew Chuck's piece uh, and I liked it also very much. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, agree, I absolutely agree with, with a lot of what he says and he's certainly more of a China expert than, than I am uh, in terms of history. Um, and so I, I wanted to focus just on the last 10 years, mainly because I wanted to explain the, um, the very fast, uh, the, or I should say the, the speed of which, by which China really accelerated its uh, actions in the South China Sea. So yes, China, you know, they seized the you know, mischief freeze in 1995 and in the 70s. And, the, you know, there were different time periods. They, you know, the original claim was made in 1947. So it's not that this is a new thing. So absolutely. But to me, it, this, the 2009 uh, note verbal and response seemed to be a, a real shift in, in strategy. And, and, and Andrew acknowledges that, you know, as, as one of the, you know, a surge. Uh, but uh, so, I, you know, if anything, I could I could certainly reflect in the paper that this has been a long term goal um, at the same time, though. And, you know, um, uh, Taylor Fravel works a lot on you know, ter Chinese strategy and, and territorial disputes. And, you know, there, th this is a different animal also, you know, compared to, as I said, it's not a traditional territorial or maritime dispute because China really has ha treated those disputes very differently than this. Um, so it's hard to imagine. Uh, you know, a lot of, and, a, and in many cases, China uses this, this strategy of shelving the dispute, you know, and for a lot of time they did, that's what they did with the South China Sea. And all of a sudden it became a really big deal and then China went full force ahead. So to me, that seems very indicative of something beyond what was happening before 2009 or in those, those years. Mm. Uh, but so, and yeah, and I'll, I mean, there are other comments I could get, but I wanna, uh, I'll leave time for other comments and questions. Thank you so much.
Th thanks, Krista. Um, I, 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 people are starting to warm up and we've got lots of questions here. Um, I, I'm trying to group some of them and um, there's a pair of, I think, quite related questions that go in different directions. So I'm going to ask uh, Manjit Singh Padassi first to ask his question and then Ben Zela. Um, and if you don't mind, we'll take those two together um, because I, I think th th they are related. Ma Manji, do, do you want to ask your question? Please? Sure. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you uh, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I have to say that uh, I really like uh, uh, some of your older work and your work on issue linkage, in particular in territorial disputes, uh, has influenced yeah. my own work. So it's been a, an absolute pleasure uh, to hear you speak today. Um, I have two questions slash comments, uh, and uh, my, my first one has to do with the South China Sea, East China Sea comparison. Uh, can it be argued that uh, the United States has been less forceful in articulating its interests in the South China Sea uh, disputes than uh, in the East China Sea? Uh, I mean, uh, Mischief, the 1970s Paris Mischief Reef, uh, 2012 Scarborough, but the US has not drawn any red lines. Whereas when it comes to the East China Sea disputes, uh, Obama said very clearly that you know, these islands are covered by the treaty uh, and so on. So, so why do you think uh, that's the case? And perhaps, uh, and I'm, I'm just trying to be contrarian, perhaps China is trying to be opportunistic. Uh, so China sees uh, a strategic opportunity uh, to expand uh, its uh, power for the exact reasons that you've mentioned. Um, so, so perhaps it could be that. Uh, and related to this is my second question, uh, which has to do with uh, security-driven behavior versus uh, power-driven behavior. So perhaps China could only expand into the parasols in the 1970s because of Chinese capabilities. And perhaps China can do more today because China's capabilities have grown. So if, if that's the logic that is guiding Chinese behavior, then can we expect similar behavior you know, outside this region, maybe the South Pacific, maybe the Indian Ocean uh, in the future and so on. So in that sense, China is not a security seeker, but a power maximizer, if you like. Uh, thank you. Thank, thanks, Manjit. Th thanks for the suggestions of, of those two angles. I'm going to turn to Ben Zela. Ben, would you, rather than me reading your question, which you've kindly put up on the chat, would you like to ask it yourself? Sure, that's fine. Thanks, Evelyn. Um, thanks, Krista. That was a terrific paper. I really, really enjoyed it and, and learned a lot. Um, so, yeah, what I was asking about is, it seems in your analysis from both in the paper and in what you were saying, that really this link between the US military presence and the real dominance in Northeast Asia um, is the key to the Chinese strategic imperative in, in the South China Sea. So in other words, if you didn't have that, perhaps China would be acting very, very differently in the South China Sea. That's what, there's nothing inherent to that geographic area that makes them act in that way. It's because of that starting point. So I guess I'm just asking, does the logic of that um, imply that really the only major factor that would shift Chinese behavior, or at least the dynamics in the South China Sea is some sort of change in the US presence in Northeast Asia. And that could either be a change, could be a drawdown in some degree, or it could be the opposite. It could be an increase in capabilities making the South China Sea even more important um, from the Chinese perspective. Or do you think actually just other things in the kind of relative military balance between them could shift that? So if this is about getting the SSBNs out into the, into the um, waters of the Western Pacific, or even down south and the other way to the Indian Ocean, if China, decided, look, it's too difficult to do this. We're going to hedge in another way and double our land-based ICBM force. That could perhaps make the South China Sea still important for the same reasons, but just less so. Could you think of other ways of um, changing the dynamics? Thanks, Ben. Um, so, Krista, sorry to load you, but again, this, this actually, Ben takes us in a direction that relates to what Natasha Hamilton Howard wants to ask. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to slip in, you know, a third related. Natasha, do, do you want to ask this? Um, sure, and I think I'm also coattailing on Manjeet's question as well. And I guess this is a really basic question of, um, do we need the deterrence part of your framework? Because your conclusion, the bottom line is, is, is number one, China wants to deter a US attack. Well, of course, but why would, I mean, really, does China really fear a US attack um, on, on, you know, on the mainland? Um, because of all of the last 70 years, <laughs> Um, there have been probably better times for the US to do this. And I noted that on your slide where you talked about um, 
China's justifications for why this is a deterrent strategy. You use that phrase, that it's a justification. But I wondered if, well, is it really just, you know, is, do you actually believe it? Um, I mean, if the US were to somehow provide a credible reassurance to China that the US is purely a status quo power, isn't going to threaten the mainland, um, would, would, would we see anything different? Thanks very much. Um, that's quite a lot on your plate, Krista. So please just feel free to take some of it away, but address what you can here. And I should add that for everyone who's putting your questions into the chat box, we will ensure that Krista gets a copy of them so that she can take them away and mull over them later on as well. Please, Krista. Great. Thank you. Uh, okay, excellent questions. Uh, this is this is great. So, uh, Majit, and, and also uh, to Ben's question, I think they're both the, the, about the Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, and East China Sea, South China Sea connection. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's a, it's very interesting, but not surprising. I think Manjit that uh, the U.S. is very uh, has a very clear red line and a very clear definition that they will you know, uh, def uh, defend uh, the Senkaku uh, Islands uh, and uh, on behalf of Japan. But I think part of that, you know, where that hasn't been the case in the Philippines. I'm sorry, uh, in the South China Sea, uh, particularly in re regard to the Philippines. I can't, you know, the U.S. doesn't, it has a security partnership with, with Vietnam. It's only since 2013, so it's, that's a little more vague. Uh, but, uh, you know, I mean, there, there was a shift, a slight shift in summer 2020 about that, you know, with um, uh, the Mike Pompeo saying there might, you know, we might be willing to, uh, you know, don't, you know, to de defend uh, the Philippines. But, Nevertheless, I do think, uh, you know, and this gets more to Ben's question too about the alliance system. I think that that long term, very, very strong alliance system uh, in with particularly with Japan. I mean, Korea is more indirect. And of course, we haven't seen Korea play a role in, in the South China Sea. Japan has as part of the Quad and, and more broadly the Indo-Pacific. Korea's kind of stayed away. Uh, but not just geographically, but because of its relationship with China. Uh, but Japan, the U.S.-Japanese relationship is so strong and so, you know, airtight. There is no way that, Japan, that you know, China would be stupid, right, to try to challenge any of that. That's just not, that's a no-go, right? So, t and, and the same with Taiwan. I mean, that, you know, if you, what made me actually think about this, Ben, is when I looked at the map, if you look at a map of East Asia, it's, the South China Sea is actually not ideal. If, you know, the Philippine archipelago really blocks the South China Sea to get access to the, you know, the blue waters of the Pacific beyond uh, on the, on the uh, east side of the, the open waters, in other words, of the Pacific. So it's not actually the most ideal. I mean, if you look at a map, north and south of Taiwan would be the most ideal. I mean, some of the Parasol Islands get that, but they're not that far north. Um, so to me, it, it does seem, uh, you know, if, if, the, if China wanted to have access, um, it would be through a different locations, but they're, they're held, they're, you know, their hands are tied. They can't go through those channels. So the South China Sea is the best, the next best thing, I think. I don't know if that's really true or not, but I feel like that's what's going on. So yeah, if there were a drawdown or an increase in Northeast Asia, there might be a shift, but I, I don't see that happening, you know, anytime uh, soon. Uh, so uh, even, even though Japan is, you know, every few years, you know, we see more and more defense capabilities and a little more independence, you know, that I just don't see the US, you know, Japanese alliance shifting. Um, so re with regard to the deterrence question, that's a great, great point. And Natasha, I actually did think about that. Like, is, is the, would the U.S. really even attack? No. And, and a lot of people are like, that's no way. There's, that's, you know, stupid. No, they would never do that. But I think that, you know, from a broad, long-term perspective, thinking out to 2040, that's what we're talking about here, is not today, but up to 2040, as you know, as China continues rising and this power transition may likely happen, what is the U.S. going to do? Is it going to sit back and say, "Okay, you know, we're just going to let this happen," or is the U.S. going to try at least not to not to attack the mainland from like a war, from an invasion perspective? That's not going to happen. Nobody wants that. But trying to take out missiles, you know, trying to take out things that are probably a provocative 
you know, in a provocative way. So I don't, I, you know, I, I don't think uh, many people believe that there's going to be a war, but uh, in, in the near future, but in the long term, from a deterrence perspective, I think, you know, that's, that's where people are, I think, you know, most people are thinking, and that's kind of what, where I was thinking from. Thanks, Krista. Um, I think in, in the course of that very comprehensive engagement, the questions that were asked, you've also answered some of the other questions that have been posed in the chat box already. Um, I, I know that Rohan Mukherjee asked, uh, put in a question much earlier on, and I think that there are certain points of um, conversation with what you've just said. Rohan, did, did you want to come in on, on this? Sure. Video? Thank you very much. Thanks for the, for the talk. Um, I was just curious about sort of the, the discussion of alternative explanations and the sovereignty motive that you talked about. And it seems to me that many of the things you pointed out as evidence of there not being that motive um, don't quite, I mean, I, you can make the opposite argument as well, right? Um, and so in terms of observable, observable implications, I don't necessarily see much of a difference between projected deterrence and sovereignty. So just a question about how we'd actually separate this, those out better because the Fravel argument doesn't quite support it either, because his argument is that China compromises when it's domestically weak, which is less and less the case now. So we would expect it to actually, his argument predicts what we see even on sovereignty grounds. So thanks. Yeah, great question. Um, so yeah, I actually, I had to clarify the last time I gave this talk, and I clearly need to be careful in the paper as well, about what I'm talking about. I think, you know, there's a question that China wants control of these, you know, and whether it's sovereignty or not, because they need to have, they need to hold on to these military outposts, you know, and, and, and Brandon's right that there is a debate about whether China, these, these military outposts are that important and that, you know, and then can, can China really actually defend them and are they really that important? Uh, but from a sovereignty perspective, what I think that alternative explanation is really more about is the legal angle, the international law angle. So that, yes, from a, from a, from a control, territorial and maritime control perspective, yes, China, the, the, the argument is not that different. Where it differs is that, uh, you know, if, if you were to say, well, China has a legitimate claim from, le from a legal perspective based on historic precedent, your know, historic title, um, and, and that's what this is about. Um, I think that's where I would would come in and say mm, I'm not so I'm a little suspicious of that. And there, you know, there's a great book uh, by Tom and Gia, I think, who provided the the Chinese perspective after the arbitration. Uh, they wrote it during the arbitration. I think it was 2014 or 2015. And and I, when I read that, they they just kept trying and trying and trying to make China's legal case like over and over. And it was like this hollow. Like, is it really, really about that? I just don't buy it. Like, it's just to me. So I do think that um, that it's really more about the legal international law perspective. Like, I don't think China wants to play the unclose game. In other words, that that's, I guess, more of what I'm trying to say, rather than they don't want sovereignty. Does that make sense? So that's, but, but thank you for that, for, for helping me try to clarify that. Thanks, Krista. Okay, we have about 10 minutes to go, and so I'm going to get really efficient at this point. Um, uh, Curie Park has a question that will take us more into the, uh, the region, so, so I'd like her to have a chance to ask you this. And then after Curie, I'm going to take Hunter Marston's first question, just the first question, Hunter, um, and then perhaps you can address them together. Curie? Uh, yeah, thank you for sharing your work. And uh, I just wanted to ask this question as a researcher who examines security cooperation in the Asia Pacific. So in your work, you primarily focus on strong and tough behavior that China demonstrate to project power and deter rivals. And I wanted to get your thoughts on what evidence of cooperation in the South China Sea between China and China, Southeast Asian countries nowadays would mean for your projected deterrent theory. So despite the tension, like China is increasingly uh, engaging in security cooperation activities with the countries in the region. For instance, in 2018, there, there was the first joint maritime exercise uh, between China and ASEAN countries. Uh, to practice the code of uh, the code for unplanned encounters at sea to reduce uncertainty and build trust. So, what would um, this kind of evidence of cooperation increasing in the region would mean for your part projected uh, deterrent theory? Thank you. You want thanks, to hear? Thanks, Hunter. Yes, thanks. Uh, thank you, Krista, for the brilliant presentation. I learned a lot from that. 
Um, my, my question sort of builds on uh, Kiri's, uh, perhaps. Um, I'm wondering, with your the, the way you framed the paper around China's projected deterrence uh, being, being um, based on uh, China's wanting to push back on uh, the US and deter the United States primarily, I'm wondering, how do, how do the individual bilateral disputes with uh, South China Sea Maritime uh, claimants uh, factor in? Are they subsumed under this larger um, geopolitical uh, struggle competition with the United States? And uh, sort of pairing that with um, Gary's question, um, I guess I, I'm wondering if these smaller states are just pawns, uh, what's in it for them? Why do they continue to hedge and cooperate on things like the Code of Conduct and uh, Declaration on Code of Conduct with uh, China and South China Sea? Thanks. Great questions. Thank you both. Uh, so yeah, I, I've always been, I have to admit, a little suspicious of the Code of Conduct and the Declaration of Conduct uh, efforts. And I have talked extensively to Phil Philippine officials, also Vietnamese min uh, foreign affairs people. Um, and I, a little bit, uh, I know Brunei, I should mention Brunei actually has, is a disputant too. I always forget about them. And I actually talked to them as well. Uh, and a little bit with Malaysians too. And I'm always a little when I hear people, they take it so seriously. And I think you're right, Kiri, that, and, and Hunter, that there are these bilateral relations going on. There's security cooperation and they're, they're, all of those states have to hedge for, and it's not just because of the, they're trying to, uh, you know, persuade China not to seize more, you know, to harass them in the South China Sea, but clearly for economic reasons, right? And China's rising, you know, rising, a rise as an economic power uh, in the region and and clearly the dominant economic power over the US, uh, they have to do that, right? They have to hedge. So to me, I think that there's, the, I would say these are almost like parallel tracks that are happening simultaneously. So yes, I, you know, I'm probably exaggerating that these are just pawns, you know, mere pawns in this, in this bigger game. But I also think these states are aware that they're pawns. They know, you know, these officials I talked to in the Philippines are fully aware that this is a bigger, a much bigger game for China, you know, and they know this is the U.S. is the, is the primary target, but they also view it in the cons, in the perspective of the Philippines as a U.S. ally. So when I first wrote this paper, I actually had a very different approach, and that was uh, that these disputants were targeted as at an ally, and in the case of Vietnam, a strategic partner, and the other states as well, strategic partners, and that they were kind of being manipulated, uh, not that they made up this dispute. It's not that they just said, oh, we're just going to have this dispute for, for the U.S. to target the U.S., but it's because of, of these relationships in, in the U.S. Uh, concern about these Southeast Asian states that the U.S. was drawn into this region in the first place, right? So the, because of the Asia pivot, and and so the, it's all kind of you know combined together. So I don't think that I think these bilateral relations are happening. The hedging is happening. The states have to hedge, with, uh, you know, against the U.S. and with in, and against China, and and try to get what they can. Uh, Duterte has done a great job of that to some degree. Some people would say uh, for for uh, the Philippines. Um, so I don't think that they're just pawns, but, and I don't think, you know, I think that these, these you know, um, DOC, COC talks have to continue, but we should also be aware that there is a broader strategy going on that China is, you know, thinking about in a different context against the U.S. So there's only going to be so much push and pull with those, with those uh, security cooperations and that, Unfortunately, I, you know, that's, that's as good as it's going to get, I think. I don't, I mean, if they would have signed it a, a decade ago if they were going to sign it. So, you know, to me, it's, it's a, a bit of a shell game just to kind of move around, you know, things, the shells and, you know, keep them going. Um, uh, but I, I, I probably am more of a, a skeptic than with these security cooperations than, than many others. Thanks, Krista. Um, on, on the South China Sea and, and Southeast Asian sort of imperatives to do with that, I guess, again, at the risk of being a bore, I mean, I, I remind everybody of the, geo of the geography of this, obviously. I mean, you know, China is much more than simply an economic power for Southeast Asian countries, obviously. Um, it is the resident power in the region. 
Um, so when we talk about Southeast Asian countries hedging, they're really hedging against two things, right? One, one they're hedging against the being let down by the United States, right? But two, importantly, they're also hedging against the possibility of Chinese preponderance in the region. One of these great powers could go anywhere any moment at once. The other one won't go anywhere. So the geography, the resident nature of the power is, is I think the thing that casts the major shadow over Southeast Asian, the limits of Southeast Asian choices when it comes to thinking about uh, strategic approaches to China. Um, and again, that, that geography part, I think, um, sometimes gets lost in, in the discussion. Um, I'm not saying anything that my other colleagues who work on Southeast Asia here don't know. But um, we, we have a couple of minutes nicely. And I wanted to turn finally to Sophie Yi. Um, Sophie, if I can ask you just to ask the first part of your question, I think that would be a nice way to just take this discussion a little bit and give Krista a chance to project forward a bit. Sophie, are you happy to ask the part one of your question? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Professor Goh. Thank you for uh, the wonderful talk, uh, Krista. Um, so uh, the recent the, the Chinese Coast Guard law was uh, established, uh, you know, published earlier this month, uh, which legalized the Coast Guard's right to use uh, the police equipment and weapons, uh, including handheld weapons, vessel borne uh, and or airborne weapons under several circumstances. How would that reflect uh, China's positions uh, in the in the South China Sea? Uh, thank you. Sorry, thank you. Uh, okay, so yes, the Chinese Coast Guard law. This is, to me, this is a further signal. Uh, you know, that I don't think China is going to be seizing any future features anytime soon. I mean, there's some concern about that, but I think that for now, uh, the focus, China's focus is primarily on continuing the sea control and the denial, the deterrence by denial of uh, freedom of navigation and making sure that uh, the disputant states, uh, other fishing, ves you know, fishing vessels, other uh, vessels uh, of the disputant states, their own navies, coast guards, et cetera, are not um, able to, to have that freedom of navigation and so forth. So uh, I think this is just a strong signal, a further strong signal of co compellence to stop. You know, it's, it's, it's a threat to use force uh, if they don't, if they don't stop doing, you know, with, in, in terms of freedom of navigation. So I think that to me, that's just a furthering of the strategy of compellence. And it just furthers, um, to me, that's a, uh, more evidence that um, the, the China's taking more risks, you know, or they're being more aggressive and more assertive in, in the region. Um, thanks very much, Christopher, for, um, your really nice presentation, a really substantive meaty discussion as well um, with, with, with people who've, who've come to this seminar. Um, I'm very pleased that you made time to join us and I hope that you found some of this useful for taking the paper forward. As I said, we'll send you what's been sent in the chat in terms of what's been written up as questions as well. Um, so it's, it's my uh, pleasure then to sort of ask everybody to thank Krista in the usual way, in spite of being online. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, and to remind everyone also that we have um, seven more, no, sorry, five more of these um, women in Asia Pacific security uh, seminars coming up, the next of which will take place on the 29th of April. It is a round table on what's so special about Asian security and looking at non-traditional uh, security issues and non-state actors. So we'll be sending out the invitations and advertising for that pretty soon. Um, we've got a whole series of exciting talks uh, coming up after that as well. Um, so please look at our website for details. Um, again, a reminder that we've put the link up um, right at the top of the chat uh, stream uh, to Krista's event page, which includes a short reading list as well. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. It's been wonderful to see you. Um, and thank you, Krista. And we look forward to keeping in touch and eventually to seeing your paper in print. Great. Thank you all so much for your comments and feedback.